So do you need and not unmute? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so maybe we should start. Great, so it's a pleasure to have to pay from Harvard who will speak about compactification of 6D theories. So do thank you and take it away. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Um, and thanks to all the organizers for putting together this wonderful series of seminars. So um, the theme of this seminar series is about quantum field theory and its interplay with geometry. And there are various ways of connecting the two subjects. One way that I'm particularly fond of is via six dimensional theories. So, and the idea is that once you compatify a six dimensional theory on an internal manifold, then you get another quantum field theory in lower dimensions. Namely, if you consider T, a six dimensional theory, um, the following geometry, MD, a compact D-dimensional manifold times the Euclidean space R um, six minus D. And then you reduce the size of MD, then at low energy, you end up with um, effectively six minus D-dimensional theory. So this process is particularly nice if this theory in six dimension has additional uh, good properties such as supersymmetry and conformal symmetry. And for this reason, um, SIGT is somewhat special. So after this compatification, interesting geometric data, such as non-sure topology of this D-dimensional manifold will be turned into interesting dynamics encoded in the quantum field theory and if, for example, uh, on one side, you have something like a torus, then the action, uh, geometric action of the mapping class group uh, of SL2Z will act as dualities of the quantum field theory. So um, this is a special case that you see some connection. And in general, there are usually very interesting and deep connections between the two subjects. So to just briefly mention some applications of safety theories uh, to the world of uh, geometry and topology. So there are two special classes of uh, safety theories that are often used in such applications. One is known as 62.0 theories that many of you are extremely familiar with. They are classified by AD Dinkin diagrams so pick any thinking diagrams uh, over here uh, that would label for you a six dimensional two comma zero theory. And you can compatify this on various manifolds. And I will perhaps mention just one application for a manifold in each dimension. For four manifolds, you will get a two dimensional theory, which try to know a lot about the model space of instantons. If you compatify that on uh, three manifolds, that quantum field theory can be used to study ge geometry and topology of three manifolds. So that can lead to some new invariants in the world of quantum topology. And as for two manifolds, um, it leads to also extremely interesting interplay between geometry and uh, physics. In fact, um, well, that dates back, I guess, to the original work of Zyberg and Witten on um, uh, solving uh, infrared physics of Ford and equal two theory using um, ge geometric and uh, homorphic ideas. So as an application of quantum field theory to, um, to uh, geometry, so here, um, because the geometry of two manifold is rather simple, the uh, geometric object that really appear that is uh, more interesting are various modular spaces associated with uh, two manifolds. And um, as many of you are familiar with, if you consider such a theory, and if you look at its Coulomb branch, that gave you um, hyper modular space. And then 
um, studying the quantum field theory lead to uh, interesting insights into the hypercalar geometry of these multi spaces. There are, of course, many more applications, and I will probably just uh, mention these few. And then for another class of uh, 61 comma zero theories, well, technically this includes the previous uh, class and it's a much bigger universe. And many of them are labeled not by uh, AD Dinkin diagrams now, but singular elliptic caveat threefolds. And even you, if you are not an uh, expert in singular elliptic caveat threefolds, you can easily guess that there are many more such manifolds compared to AD Dinkin diagrams. And these theories um, also have interesting geometric applications. For example, you can compactify um, a 61 comma zero theory on four manifolds. And then you end up with some two dimensional theory and you can try to extract some topological invariants from these um, 2D theories. And um, after studying this, um, we conjectured that this could lead to some novel type of invariants of four manifolds that are valued not in usual numbers, but in the ring of topological modular forms. You can also try to compactify that on three manifold and study what kind of three manifold invariants that you get. So very conjecturally, this should lead to some, again, novel type of invariants of three manifolds that are not valued in numbers or even vector spaces, but instead modules over the ring of topological modular forms. And for compatibilization of 6D theory, 61.0 theory on two manifolds, this has been um, a very active uh, field of research recently, and there has been many interesting physical developments. And I guess it's uh, just a matter of time that there will be interesting geometric applications. So today, um, the focus is not about all these applications uh, to specific geometric problems. Instead, the focus is about universal aspects of the compatibilization of 6D theories. And the focus will be symmetries and anomalies. So mostly um, it's based on joint work with two great collaborators, Sergey and Poshin. And as a quick reminder of um, quantum field theory with anomalous global symmetry, So for such a quantum field theory, it's usually um, a very good idea to view that not just as a standalone quantum field theory, but instead as a boundary theory coupled to a topological theory in one dimension higher. And for the topological theory in one dimension higher, there are two possibilities. One is that it's an invertible theory and that is uh, saying that the Hilbert space that you associate, that is a theory associated to any d-dimensional manifold, is one-dimensional. These are special classes of um, topological quantum field theory that are particularly nice. And in this case, uh, we sometimes uh, say that the boundary quantum field theory is absolute. Here in principle, one can also make a distinction between trivial invertible theory versus non-trivial invertible theory. Uh, I will not try uh, very hard to make this distinction in this talk. And um, a somewhat um, qualitatively different case is uh, when the t T is non-invertible. That's when uh, the Hilbert space that you associate to some d-dimensional manifold has higher dimensions, has dimension greater than one. So in this case, um, it is often said that the uh, boundary quantum field theory is relative. For absolute theories, the partition function is well-defined um, 
at least up to um, overall uh, factor. But for relative theory, to actually talk about partition function, we need to choose a state in the TQFT Hilbert space. So a state V in the TQFT Hilbert space would label a partition function of the um, entire couple system. Alternatively, one can try to find a basis for this Hilbert space. After choosing a basis, then one can talk about the partition function given by each basis element, and that leads to a partition vector of the boundary theory. And why are we uh, interested in uh, such uh, relative theory, especially in 6D? Well, because the naturally um, occurring 6D theories uh, tend to be relative. For example, in the classification that uh, I mentioned, for all these 6D theories labeled by AD Dinkin diagrams, all of them are relative, except the uh, special one labeled by E8. And these theories are relative and uh, they couple to a bulk theory that take a somewhat simple form. So the bulk theory uh, is given by a three-form transaction theory. C here, these are three-form U1 valued gauge field and Kij uh, is a coupling matrix with integer entries. So if um, instead you have um, C replaced by one form U1 gauge field, then this will be um, the usual transignment theory, abelian transignment theory in three dimensions. But now because C is a three form, this is a seven dimensional topology of quantum field theory. And for um, 61 comma zero theories, the bulk theory um, has this Kij uh, being identified with the Cartan matrix of AD thinking diagrams. And the data of uh, this Kij, this coupling matrix, define for you an abelian group. And following terminology, um, of the boundary CD theory, we'll refer to this as a defect group. So K uh, can be viewed as a map from uh, Z to R to Z to R, and D is a co-kernel of this map. And physically, the defect group tell you what are the three-dimensional defects in the 7D TQFT. So just like uh, transcendent theory has Wilson lines, the seven-dimensional theory has some three-dimensional defects. And they have grading and spin, just like um, Wilson lines in three-dimensional transcendent theory. And the way to encode the data for grading and spin is by considering a symmetric pairing on the defect group D, a U1 value symmetric pairing, and a quadratic refinement of this symmetric pairing that I denote by uh, both Q. Then, given a six manifold, combining the pairing, the symmetric pairing, on D with the anti-symmetric intersection pairing, we we'll have an uh, anti-symmetric pairing on H3 of the six manifolds with D coefficient. And uh, in the past, um, when um, partition function of 60 theories are, were discussed, a notion of um, polarization was introduced and is often defined as a choice of maximal isotropic subgroup of H3 of the six manifold with D coefficient. And the idea was that if you make such a choice, 
then you kind of expect that um, you can obtain a state in um, in the Hilbert space of the TKFT associated with the six manifold. And therefore, that leads to a, a particular partition function. So uh, what we will do first is to uh, take a closer look at um, this uh, notion of polarization and try to slightly refine it and then generalize it to a notion of polarization, uh, not necessarily six manifold, but a more general manifold. So here, uh, it's more convenient to define um, a set of polarization on six manifolds, not as a um, maximal isotropic subgroup, but instead um, ways of reducing the six dimensional theory to absolute zero dimensional theory. And we'll um, only consider reductions that are universal, meaning that um, it is universal from the point of view of the TQFT. So for any boundary theory of the same TQFT, uh, uh, the reduction can be done for uh, all of them. So uh, in other words, if the boundary theory has some specific flavor symmetry, and uh, of course, when reducing on six manifolds, I can try to turn various holonomy and fluxes of this flavor symmetry but that shouldn't count. We are only counting things that are universal from the point of view of the bulk TQFT. So the six dimensional theory um, has anomalous two form symmetries and the uh, TQFT in seven dimension is capturing the anomaly of this two form symmetry. And what happens if one reduces um, a six manifold so it turns out that the two form symmetry, once you, uh, these are in six dimension or six or seven dimensions are generated by three dimensional objects. And once you wrap that on three cycles, they become point operators in the one dimensional TQFT that you get. And these generate minus one form symmetries on the boundary. So recall that, um, for usual symmetry or zero form symmetry, the uh, generators are uh, co dimensional, uh, co, co dimension one uh, domain walls. And for one minus one form symmetry, you expect that the generators have the same dimension as well, their space filling defects. And because the boundary theory is zero dimensional, these point operators um, exactly fit the bill and they can generate minus one form symmetry on the boundary. And if you have two elements in um, H3 with D coefficients, that lead to operators, uh, A hat, alpha hat and beta hat acting on the boundary Hilbert space. And they won't commute because well, in seven dimensions, um, the non-trivial, um, they will have non-trivial braiding and that translates into non-commutativity of these operators uh, in the 1D theory. And one way now to get an absolute theory is to try to gauge part of this um, minus one form symmetry. This can only be done if you uh, choose a subgroup that is anomaly free. And that will translate into the isotropic condition. You also want to uh, obtain an absolute theory in the end. And that would uh, correspond to the maximal condition. So indeed, it seems that this analysis will lead you to a maximal isotropic subgroup. This um, gauging uh, operation corresponds to um, acting on the boundary, um, uh, on the boundary, some projection operators. So that uh, this um, lambda, this particular subgroup, 
then you can form this particular projection operators that acts on the boundary. And if indeed lambda is anomaly free and invertible, then this operator, you can argue that it's well defined, then it projects onto a one dimensional subspace. Furthermore, you can define a family parameterized by the dual of lambda of um, projection operators, and they form a system of rank one projectors. And then you can ask whether this uh, can define for you a basis of this Hilbert space. Well, in general, this is actually not uh, true. So in general, there are phase ambiguities. Although you have a system of rank one projector, you still need to pick some um, um, vectors um, in each of the one dimensional uh, space that you project onto. And usually there are no canonical ways of uh, doing that. And there can be phase ambiguities. But when lambda check is uh, anomaly free, which is basically saying that uh, this particular short exact sequence split, or equivalently, uh, H3 can be decomposed into a sum of lambda and a lambda bar, which is a lift of lambda check to H3. Well, this is the case that actually the Hilbert space, um, you can find a well-defined basis for it. And the Hilbert space will be defined as the uh, C-span of, um, of lambda bar. And we will use this notation for the basis vectors. And then that leads to um, uh, uh, one such basic vector will lead to a component of the partition vector. And if we are talking about another polarization, uh, because we have already found a complete basis, then you can try to expand the partition function uh, to write it as a linear combination of components of this uh, um, of these uh, individual uh, basic building blocks. And this can be done um, by acting the uh, projection operator given by lambda prime on these basis vectors. Uh, interestingly, there is um, ambiguity. And uh, the reason that I uh, went into a somewhat uh, detailed discussion of this is to exactly um, mention this ambiguity. So there's ambiguity of defining in general uh, such a projection operator. So here uh, you are summing over some subgroup of H3 uh, of the third uh, cohomology of your six manifold with D coefficients. But um, there's a non-trivial step here. You want to turn elements in this group into an operator acting on the Hilbert space. And if you have promoted alpha to alpha hat, uh, beta to beta hat, with alpha and beta being two elements here, uh, because this is a abelian group, uh, you have to decide what to do with alpha plus beta. And because uh, alpha hat and beta hat won't commute, um, it's perhaps not a good idea to send alpha plus beta to either beta hat alpha hat or alpha hat beta hat. So you want something like um, a square root of the face here times alpha hat beta hat. That uh, um, looks like a better choice. But in general, um, taking the square root of this face requires some additional structure. And if you uh, carefully went through this exercise, you'll find that uh, you need something extra than just a choice of maximizer trophy subgroup. You also need a quadrant refinement on this uh, particular uh, subgroup, uh, lambda prime. And then the partition function would uh, take this form. So this quadratic function on lambda prime will be exactly the face that appear here.
So um, let me mention an example. Since the discussion uh, just happened in the past uh, 10 minutes, it may sound a little bit um, abstract. So if you consider uh, potentially the simplest six manifolds with non-trivial H3 as three times S3, and consider the case of uh, the defect group just being Z2, then uh, H3 of the six manifold with Z2 coefficients will be simply two copies of Z2. And uh, for some reason that will be perhaps clear later, we'll refer to the two Z2s as the uh, lambda, as lambda E and lambda M, E for electric and M for magnetic. And then um, you can pick either lambda E or lambda M as your lambda and treat the other one as lambda bar. If you treat uh, lambda E as your uh, maximum isotropic subgroup and lambda M as, the, um, as lambda bar, then that defines for you um, basis of this Hilbert space. And we'll refer to that as the electric basis. So the Hilbert space is going to be two dimensional. So there are two basic vectors denoted by zero and one. And then there are in total three different choices of maximal isotropic subgroups. You can either uh, choose lambda E, lambda M, or the diagonal one. And these uh, three choices can perhaps be referred to SU2, SO3 plus, uh, SO3 minus. The reason that this is appropriate uh, will be clear in a moment. But um, um, as mentioned, you need not only a choice of maximum isotropic subgroup, you also need a quadratic function. If you take in, into account the choice of the Q, um, it turns out that there will be in total six different polarizations. And they correspond to these uh, six different vectors in the Hilbert space. And they each uh, label an absolute zero dimensional theory that you can obtain by reducing the uh, six dimensional theory. And uh, we'll refer to these theories as the SU2 theory, SO3 with uh, 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 index by 0, 1, 2, 3 as the uh, four valued parameter, and spin SU2 theory. And here, um, although uh, we use uh, this fine no 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 notation of uh, SU2 and uh, SO3, signaling that perhaps we are dealing with the 60 theory labeled by the A1 uh, thinking diagram. But in fact, this relation is universal. So here, the discussion would apply to any other 60 theories with the same defect group. I'm sorry, what mm -hmm. is the 60 theory? Is it the supersymmetric one or any bosonic one? Yeah, it can be any bosonic one. So here, the discussion uh, is universal in the sense that I can choose any boundary theory coupled to the same bulk theory, and then this uh, analysis apply. So for example, I can choose the uh, supersymmetric theory labeled uh, two comma zero theory labeled by the A1 uh, thinking diagram or the E7 thinking diagram. Or I can choose the uh, one comma zero theory uh, labeled by some additional uh, elite cardinal as long as uh, the defect group is Z2, then it still apply. The reason I ask is I'm trying to understand the labels of your SO3 theories mm -hmm. at the bottom of the page. Is this associated with being on a non-spin manifold or not? So here, uh, of course, we're talking about zero-dimensional manifolds, and uh, we're certainly not summing over like spin SU2 bundles. The reason that we choose this is because later, when we are discussing um, a reduction on two manifolds, we get some 4D theory. And um, there's a perfect analog of this here. 
So here we are, because we're anticipating this connection with 4D theories, we're using this kind of label. So in zero dimensions, um, uh, these labels shouldn't be taken uh, very seriously. But uh, in uh, a moment, it will be clear. Whether your sixth manifold has to be a spin manifold or not. Oh, so here, um, uh, S3 times S3 is spin. So uh, this di discussion is uh, uh, specific for this uh, particular manifold. It's chosen to be a, a particular uh, manifold that is happened to be spin. The six dimensional theory, is it a theory that can exist on non-spin manifolds or not? So um, in general, yes. So even if uh, it's supersymmetric, one can turn on uh, backgrounds so that uh, it's well defined on non-spin manifold. So in general, we are not assuming that uh, we need a spin structure on the uh, six manifold. I see. But, uh, so in my, fact, mm -hmm. my ask is a kind of a simpler stuff. But say in six dimension, uh, UV uh, definition of the theory, you know, uh, it's not uh, it's not a problem, or you know how uh, UV is, is defined. Um. So here we're, we're not using any specific um, boundary theory. We're only assuming that the theory is coupled to uh, some bulk theory that uh, is described by a three function Simon theory. And uh, perhaps um, the question is more about if I'm trying to deal with a particular choice of boundary theory, like whether I can start with some UV description, right? Uh, in yeah, general, right, but, I but think- I mean, uh... But uh, but I mean, if it's kind of uh, you know um, based on say thing theory, whatever, then you know the six dimension makes you know sense. But if I'm looking at this as quantum field theory, then I'm not sure what I, what what I should do about UV features of the six dimension, and that's why I'm asking. I mean, uh, because generically, I would think that in six dimension, it uh, say it, at least it's not perturbatively defined originally, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so here, the, the, this analysis does not uh, depend on uh, such details of the boundary theory. So as long as it's coupled with uh, this particular bulk theory, then it's, uh, then, then, then it's fine. Mm -hmm. oh, right, but then I should think about this like kind of thing in, in the thing sense, right, in certain way, right? Because then, because uh, if I'm starting from 10 dimension or whatever, then what I would think that it's kind of not a, defined not as a quantum field theory, but as a, as a thing theory, and then some kind of special limit or whatever of, of the theory. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so if you want to really compute uh, some quantities, let's say some yeah. supersymmetric quantities um, from uh, some supersymmetric uh, safety theory, that's the usual approach. Like first realizing that in string theory, and use various uh, string dualities to um, mm -hmm. translate the quantity that you compute to some usual commutation in some uh, lower dimensional quantum field theory. That's indeed uh, usually what happens. I see, okay, thank you. So any more questions? So um, S3 times S3 also has a mapping class group action. And that the action of that on homology factors through an SL2Z. So one can talk about the S and T action uh, of these theories. And uh, that's fairly simple because, well, um, uh, it's easy to write down the uh, action of SL2Z on the entire Hilbert space. So therefore, for these six different vectors in the Hilbert space, you can uh, figure out what's the mapping class group action. And uh, later, we'll leave this to 4D, and then it will confirm a conjecture um, of um, Ang and company about how different versions of 4D gauge theory with various gauge group um, translate into each other and SL2Z. And um, I keep emphasizing that the discussion is universal. What it means for this particular diagram is that you can replace uh, SU2 with E7. Well, they have the same defect group. Um, and the analysis will be the same. And you will have this diagram for the E7 theory. So um, 
because S3 times S3 is fairly simple. You can consider uh, various uh, examples that are slightly more complicated. For example, you can consider the theory um, with uh, D being two copies of Z2. And uh, one example of this is the um, sig D2 comma zero theory labeled by spin eight. And then you can classify the polarization. For example, uh, without quadratic refinement, you'll find 15 maximum isotropic subgroups. And each will have four quadratic refinements. So in total, there are uh, 60 polarizations. The Hilbert space now is four dimensional and you can work out what, um, what are these uh, vectors that correspond to all these uh, 60 different polarizations. For example, there are four different theories that I would refer to as uh, four different SO8 minor theories that correspond to these particular four um, vectors. And then again, you can study mapping class group reaction. And there will be uh, 19 orbits of um, um, under the action of SL2Z. So for example, uh, one orbit uh, without refinement uh, would look like this. This is a particular, um, well, there are three different um, uh, choices of maximum isotropic subgroups. And once refined, this orbit will become three different orbits. And because, well, each theory uh, well, each choice of maximum isotropic subgroup, uh, there will be four different choice of quadratic refinements. So you get um, more orbits. And uh, again, this analysis is, is universal. So you can, we're here using uh, labels that are suitable for spin eight, but you can replace that with spin eight N and then you will be still the same. For spin eight, because you have triality, this um, orbit will enjoy additional symmetry, which uh, will still be there for spin eight n, simply because, well, uh, because of this universal property. So again, here uh, we are comparing all these diagrams with result in four dimension. So why is that uh, even a sensible thing to do? How to uh, leaves uh, all this discussion to uh, 4D and uh, how to generalize the polarization story to higher dimensions. So, um, if one consider compatibility not on six manifold, but on a D dimensional manifold, then one get a higher dimensional quantum field theory. And we want to define and study the notion of polarization on D dimensional manifold. So for six manifolds, we define the set of uh, polarization as uh, all the possible ways of getting absolute zero dimensional theories. And that naturally leads to the following uh, way of thinking about polarization on general manifolds. You simply ask, for different ways of reducing your six D theory uh, to get absolute six minus D dimensional theories. And again, we require that we're only considering universal reductions, not uh, using some particular uh, symmetry of the boundary theory. So this uh, looks like a sensible definition, but you may wonder whether um, you can do meaningful uh, analysis using this um, definition. First um, thing to notice is that if you have absolute theory in higher dimension, then you can compatify that. And then there are no additional, uh, well, that automatically lead to absolute theory in lower dimension. So you will have a map from uh, the set of polarization on a D manifold to a set of polarization on a D manifold times another manifold. So therefore, one way to view uh, 
a polarization on a D manifold, he says the family of polarization on M D times M six minus D. And they will have some nice functorial property in the six minus D direction. So if you consider um, M D times any uh, M six minus D, because you will end up with a polarization on this product six manifold, that will lead to uh, an, a choice of maximum isotropic subgroup inside this H3. And further, there will be a quadratic function on this subgroup. And you want uh, these two uh, pieces of uh, data to be functorial. But what does that actually uh, mean? So it's uh, useful to uh, think in terms of, um, to, to think of this polarization in terms of the T correct T. So in the zero dimensional case, we see that the projection operator defined like this play an interesting role. And from the TKT perspective, this projection operator can be viewed as the topological boundary condition of the one dimensional TKT obtained by reducing the 70 theory on the six manifold. And this can be readily generalized to topological boundary conditions of the seven minus D dimensional manifold obtained by reducing the 70 theory on MD. So from the TKFT point of view, this is a, the way to get absolute theories. So you consider a boundary condition for the TKFT. So here, uh, one can be slightly more general. So instead of just considering literally boundary conditions, uh, one can uh, consider a domain wall, topological dom domain wall between the TKFT and the invertible TKFT. And then, because it's topological, you can collide the domain wall with the boundary where the relative theory lives. And then, after colliding, you will have this picture. On the boundary, you will have an absolute theory coupled to an invertible TKFT. And one expects that uh, polarization on D manifolds would correspond to topological boundary condition of this theory, of this uh, six minus D dimensional theory, modulo some uh, uh, redundancies. Of course, here you know that uh, for topological boundary condition, if you have one, then you can stack on top of it um, decoupled TQFT. Uh, you need to factor out this kind of uh, degree of freedom. After factoring out that kind of degree of freedom, you uh, would expect that um, they are in one-to-one -one correspondence with um, uh, elements in uh, the set of pol polarizations on MD. So how to um, come up with um, any uh, polarization? One obvious thing to do is, well, instead of choosing a maximum isotropic subgroup of six manifolds, now we will choose some subgroup in uh, H star of MD such that it pairs trivially with itself under this pairing. And there are usually some uh, nice choices that are, uh, I would refer to as geometric polarizations. These are given by um, choices of D plus one dimensional manifold whose boundary is a D manifold, MD. So if you do that, then you can try to restrict cohomology classes on W to the boundary. And that gave uh, you a subgroup that's automatically pair trivially with itself. And this L would have uh, different uh, pieces. We only care about the pieces um, in degree smaller than three, because well, we're reducing in the end a three-form field. And then 
uh, if you consider uh, MD times M6 minus D, this lambda M6 minus D will be defined by the image of this map. And this is also automatically maximal isotropic. So, there, so this is a way to generate polarizations. And uh, further, you also need a choice of creative function, which is not part of the data when you uh, simply choose L. You need, in addition, uh, to choose uh, this Q. So this is one way of uh, obtaining uh, polarizations. But you would expect that in general, there are more uh, topological boundary conditions for this TQFT that uh, won't simply come from this kind of simple construction. So for the rest, we refer to them as mixed polarizations. These are other ways of coming up with uh, this lambda and Q for all M6 minus D that are also functorial. So um, why not uh, consider some uh, simple example like um, S1. So if we reduce uh, the SIGD theory on S1, we get five dimensional theories. And for any polarization, uh, we will have a family lambda and five for any five manifolds, which is um, maximum isotropic subgroup of this. And obviously there are two uh, natural choices. These are the two uh, pure polarizations that are somewhat canonical. You can take L to be the zero degree piece of the cohomology of S1. Then it uh, will trivialize the cohomology pairing. And this leads to the choice of uh, this maximum isotropic group being just uh, this uh, degree three pieces, the degree three piece of this uh, sum. And for this theory, uh, it can be perhaps referred to as SUP theory, because if uh, you start with a 62 comes with theory labeled really by, um, oh, um, this should really be, uh, yes, um, a, a p minus one, labeled by a p minus one, then th you'll literally get a gauge theory with SUP gauge rule. Another choice that should let the pairing uh, is that uh, you take the degree one piece of the, in the cohomology group of S1, then that corresponds to choosing this family of maximum isotropic subgroups given by H2 of M5. And that uh, is, um, can be referred to as the PSUP theory. So these are before uh, choosing the quadratic refinement. If you look at uh, the possible quadratic refinements, you will quickly realize that there has to be Z2 value in this case. And these are the choices that are possible. For the SUP theory, you can either, treat, you can either uh, choose a Q that is uh, trivial, that is a zero function, or this particular Q. So see that this is a map from this uh, group, lambda M5, to, to Z2. And this would lead to a theory that is a close cousin of the SUP theory. That is um, probably should be referred to as a spin SUP theory. In that theory, um, if you really have a gate theory obtained by reducing the SIGD theory, then in that theory, you are not summing over SUP bundles, but instead spin SUP bundles. And there's also a close cousin of the PSUP theory given by this particular quality function. And I would refer to that theory as PSUP sub W3 theory. And in that theory, um, in the PSUP theory, you sum over all topological type of PSUP bundles. And in this theory, uh, you will 
still do the sum, but with uh, additional uh, phase inserted given by this particular quadratic function. So these are all uh, valid uh, polarizations. Um, so the, this Q, um, so here uh, I chose the letter P to suggest that something special happened when P is a prime. Indeed, when P is not a prime, then there are also uh, pure polarizations in between these two cases. And um, for this quadratic refinement to be non-trivial, you uh, will require that P is even. So if you want uh, prime P, then P equals to two. But uh, in general, for even P, you can always define these two different theories, and they correspond to uh, two valid choices of uh, polarization. So in the, in the previous case, there are no mixed polarizations. In order to get mixed polarizations, you need to consider a slightly more complicated uh, DeFi group, such as two copies of uh, ZP. Then there will be mixed polarizations. And they are actually not mysterious at all. And if you think of uh, this uh, from the point of view of gauge theory, it's something very simple. You take two copies of the SUP theory, and then you gauge um, the one form symmetry with an additional t squared theta angle term. So in other words, um, for this theory, you are summing over different um, SUP times SUP bundles, but with an additional phase inserted. And in, um, for um, polarization on S1, uh, all mixed polarization can be obtained in this way. Namely, they are always related to some pure polarization uh, via an additional discrete theta angle term. So um, the previous discussion focused on symmetry. And of course, symmetry is closely related to a spectrum of operators in the theory. And for pure polarizations, the connection is especially nice. For different uh, graded pieces of this L, they will label charges of operators in different dimensions. For example, in the 5D example that we had, this L will label Wilson lines in the 5D theory. And this is a picture of how uh, to see that you have line operators. So this polarization is geometric and is obtained by choosing a disk bounding your circle. And then if you reduce this uh, disk uh, S1, you will get a line segment. And that's this line segment. And then if you have three-dimensional uh, DeFi operators um, in red color, and then it will become um, two-dimensional surface operator stretched between the two boundaries. One boundary corresponds to the tip of this, uh, the, the center of the disk, which is this particular topological boundary condition. And um, another boundary corresponds to the uh, six-dimensional theory. So from the point of view of the six-dimensional theory, um, or rather the reduction of the six-dimensional theory, which is now um, five-dimensional, you have a line. The other choice of pure correlation is not geometric. And in that theory, there will be magnetic strings because, well, uh, now the um, degree one piece of L is non trivial. So n would equal to zero. So operator would have dimension two. 
and one can have a similar discussion about mixed polarizations because mixed polarization are related to pure polarization by discrete theta angle. The discussion is um, quite similar. So um, in view of time, let me um, just mention that for mixed polarization, because of discrete theta angle, there are interesting uh, analog of Witten effects and a boundary of um, operators, you can have fractional charges uh, for um, other symmetries. So since we have defined this notion of polarizations, one would ask how to classify them. For pure polarizations, it's uh, not terribly hard if you are given an MD because you just need to find uh, all such subgroups. Well, in addition, you need to try to find some, um, to find the uh, compatible quadratic refinement, but that can also be done. For mixed polarizations, they can also be classified because, well, roughly, uh, because they are simply related to pure polarizations by some discrete theta angle terms. So if you look at partition function, for any um, polarization, you always uh, can um, write the partition function as a linear combination of uh, different components of the partition vector. And you have a phase. And the phase has to be functorial. Um, um, when you vary, m6 minus d. So this phase has to be um, an SPT phase or invertible TQIT with symmetry. That is basically saying, again, that the mixed polarizations are related to pure polarization via some uh, discrete theta angle. So in the remaining maybe three minutes, let me um, mention um, what happens when we reduce this on two manifolds? The simplest two manifolds beside the two sphere is the two torus. For the two torus, if you want to find the pure polarizations, then that uh, become um, and that uh, will um, become uh, a two-step uh, process. First, you try to find um, subgroup of H1 that pair trivially with itself. And then you find a subgroup of the degree zero piece and the degree two pieces. But we have already encountered such a problem before because H1 of T2 with D coefficient, well, as a group is isomorphic to H3 of S3 times S3 with D coefficients. And for this part, in fact, we have also encountered this because this uh, as a group is isomorphic to the cohomology group of S1. So uh, the discussion we had about reduction on six manifold, uh, S3 times S3 and reduction on uh, S1 has already prepared us for this uh, analysis. So if one start with a 62 comma zero theory, then one get 2D gate theory. And to keep track of all symmetries, it's a good idea to uh, keep uh, one scalar compact because that's indeed what you get by reducing a uh, 6D theory and of course with finite size. And then the choice of L1 tell you what is the global form of the gauge group and, um, and what are the possible discrete theta angle terms that you uh, add to the theory. And choice of L0 will tell you what is the global form of this compact scalar. And depending on the choice of compact scalar, the theory will have different symmetry. So for example, for some choice of polarization, this is what you get. Um, SO3 minor theory with uh, SU2 uh, value scalar. Of course, this is still before taking into account the quadratic refinement. 
once taken into the quadratic refinement, then the analysis again will be exactly the same, at least for the L1 part, uh, our uh, analysis of um, correlation on S3 times S3. And that's the reason why uh, there, although we're just talking about theory on zero dimensions, we're using fancy labels like spin SU2. Because, well, here, if you choose an L and a Q, um, um, you will indeed have, um, you, you can have a theory that is summing over spin SU2 bundles. And the action of SL2Z will be again exactly the same as uh, what we had in zero dimension. So some of the polarizations uh, given by L1 and L2, uh, sorry, L1 and L0 are geometric. And then you can again um, uh, figure out what's the spectrum of this simply from geometry. And uh, you can also see uh, geometrically how um, SL2Z action acts on polarizations. So um, there are also mixed polarizations. In this case, that differ from the uh, theory given by pure polarization by some discrete data angle term. So uh, in view of time, let me not uh, go into this. Let me only mention one uh, interesting uh, additional feature uh, in the reduction of SIGD theory. That's um, uh, emergence of higher group symmetry in the lower dimensional theory. So this happened when MD has isometry. So when MD has isometry, you'd expect that after reducing on D manifold, you will have additional symmetry given by this isometry. And, but what's interesting is that they will have non-trivial interplay with the reduction of the two-form symmetry. So you have isometry and also the symmetry coming from two-form symmetry in 6D, but they have non-trivial interplay with each other. The gauge transformation has been modified in some way, and that leads to a higher group symmetry. And that higher group symmetry possibly also has anomaly. So in other words, uh, when you are reducing your three-form gauge field C in this fashion, where omegas are various close forms on um, uh, the internal manifold MD, this has to be done uh, more carefully if you want to turn on background gauge field for isometries, because this will modify these omegas, modify them to some equivariant um, um, forms. And then, um, to have a C or a DC, the curvature of C, to be gauge invariant, the transformation of all these B field has been modified. And you can even see this in a simple example when you reduce an S1, which has a U1 isometry. There, in the 5D SUN mod ZK theory, you will have a three group symmetry involving the incident symmetry, the electric symmetry, uh, corresponding to the center of this group and magnetic symmetry um, given by pi one of this group. And it turns out that the you know, non true background for instant symmetry, the transformation of uh, this other symmetry needs to be modified. And that uh, tells you that there is a three group symmetry. And that exactly uh, comes from, well, this mechanism when you reduce the 6D theory to this 5D theory. So since I'm running out of time, um, let me end here. So there are some interesting uh, things that also happen in other dimensions that I haven't got a chance to uh, mention. In even dimension zero, there is some interesting thing happening and also more uh, interesting happening in dimension three and four. And these are, uh, in particular in dimension three and four, these are work in progress with, uh, again, Sergey and Potion. So, Thank you very much, and sorry for running a bit over time. Great, thank you very much. I thank all Dupe for the nice talk. Are there questions? So actually, you say something here about the last point uh, when you have M4. Uh, could mm -hmm. you say a little bit more about what 
the yeah. effect of this on the Higgs moduli space. Right. Mm -hmm. So M four is uh, in four in four uh, four my four is particular uh, interesting. So um, there are some special phenomena going on. For example, for some four manifolds, uh, it can happen that you cannot find any polarization at all. So there, you probably just have to deal with uh, relative theories, even in, two, even in 2D. And that itself would lead to some interesting um, consequences for, let's say, um, um, uh, VOA M4. So uh, people have uh, tried to associate uh, four manifolds with work of the algebras. And when for some four manifolds, uh, you just uh, have to be the case that you have to deal with relative theory. And then uh, that also determines something about the VOA. So here, this particular comment is not about that case. So this uh, particular four manifolds would enjoy uh, many uh, polarizations. And for uh, different choice of polarization, you have different choices of minus one form symmetry, zero form symmetry, and one form symmetry. And if you um, study reduction of cyclic theory on this particular manifold, the effective theory is given by a sigma model onto the Hitchin moderate space. And there you can see the interesting interplay between choice of polarizations and um, geometry of Hitchin moderate space. For example, um, in the study of geometric long lens program, it's a good idea to keep in mind that uh, when going to a long lens dual, uh, the gauge group become different from the 4D perspective. And from 2D perspective, when you take into account like first different components of the moderate space, correspond to different topological bundles and all kinds of twisting. And this uh, can all be um, uh, translated into um, symmetries, in particular minus one form and one form symmetries of the uh, 2D theory. So there's some interesting I, discussion, is, for example, mm -hmm. by Donagy and Handel. The, okay. Yeah, that, that can be uh, reformulated from a physics point of view uh, in terms of minus one form and one form symmetry. I see. So the Hitchin moduli space is still the same sigma model into the same moduli space, but there's some other structure on this. So um, model. first of change? all, there are choice. So uh, Hitchin moduli space has isometries, mm -hmm. and um, you can consider um, gauging this isometry, namely consider mm -hmm. the quotients of right. that. But but these correspond to choices of polarization that uh, modify the zero form part. Okay. And uh, what Donega and Panda would discuss uh, is uh, more about the minus one form and the one form part. So there, for example, for SU, uh, SO3 gauge group, you consider different components given by different uh, Stephen Winnie class of your SO3 bundle um, 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 on your Riemann surface. And also on the SU2 side, you need to take into account different gerbs. Uh, and then, uh, only after taking into account all of this, geometric um, long lens correspondence would work. And there's a way of also uh, seeing this at level of quantum field theory. Uh, to, you need to uh, gauge all the symmetries to go from one polarization to another polarization. Super nice. Cool. Okay, are there other questions? I think maybe Shlomo? Yes, uh, I have a couple of questions. So w one question, you emphasize that you only consider universal uh, compactification. Mm -hmm. So what do you have in mind for not universal, like turning on oh. fluxes? Or... Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, for example, uh, I can have the same 7D TQFT, but different boundary conditions with different uh, accidental symmetries. They will have the same two form symmetry, but uh, you, there can be additional flavor symmetries or some, um, let's say, even uh, with different amount of supersymmetry, right? Mm -hmm. And um, for example, uh, for supersymmetric theory, I can turn on certain background that I cannot do for bosonic theory. And for theory with additional flavor symmetry, I can turn on additional chlorine and fluxes. So here, um, when defining this set of polarization, I'm trying to be as universal as possible. So I would not use this specific symmetry of the boundary. So but of the, course, uh, when you have symmetry, you can uh, use them to get more reductions. So when you compactify uh, the two comma zero theory and you twist, so the twist is is in 
like you consider it it doesn't interfere with what you do or? right it will not interfere with uh, what's happening here so at uh, this for example um on uh, four manifolds uh, there are various twists you can do um, there are three different twists you can do and this and that this relation between various partition functions would apply for all of them so um if you are considering buffer with a partition function um announced being manifold you always have six different um, components um, that transform into other into SL two Z, mm -hmm. and that would be exactly the same if you are doing Donaldson with a partition function or coupling with a partition function. Thank you. And another question: You skipped a couple of slides, but I just saw one <laughs> sentence. So you were you mentioned you didn't talk about it, but it was on the slide that you can get new class S theories. So what are these new class S theories? Are they dif differ by some global properties from non class yeah, S theories? Yeah, they differ or? by some global properties. Okay. So um, um, they can be obtained by gauging some symmetry of the non class S theory, but with insertion of some additional topological term. So then you are summing over um, different topological type of bundles, but with some non trivial insertion uh, in front of. But because of this, the spectrum, uh, would, uh, there, there are going to be interesting uh, implications for the spectrum. For example, uh, this additional topic term that you introduce will have a, will have Witten effects, analog of, of, of Witten effects. And the spectrum so, you mean of extended objects, not of local. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are physical differences, but uh, just from the point of partition function, you will be uh, just about inserting some additional basis. Thank you. Any other questions for Do? I don't see any more questions. We maybe we can switch off the recording and then we can have some more informal discussion.